Hey, welcome. This is a tutorial on evolution of neural networks. Um, I'm Risto Mikulainen of University of Texas at Austin, as well as uh, Cognizance AI Labs. Um, so the basic question here is, why would we want to evolve neural networks? And why neural networks in the a, in a first place? I mean, we know that they are very good in statistical domains, uh, such as image recognition, like here, character recognition, or control task or prediction and of all kinds of time series data and decision making. In general domains where um, no good theory of the domain exists. Um, and then we can use supervised learning algorithms from these examples that are collected. Uh, the network learns a nonlinear model um, of, the, of the data, and that can be very useful, utilizing the big data that exists. Uh, but it actually does not cover all the possible situations where neural networks might be useful. Um, and very early on, since in 1990s, uh, it became clear that uh, there were lots of domains where gradients didn't really exist, uh, and we didn't have targets from which to backpropagate. Um, and that's where the original role for neuroevolution came from. Uh, sequential decision tasks, where both the structure and the weights of the neural networks were evolved at the same time, there's no backpropagation at all. And we could evolve these strongly recurrent neural networks, like uh, the one on the left, uh, and use them in a PumDP domain where uh, we had to take uh, lots of history into account in order to make good decisions. Um, and, and there, it actually advanced the state of the art in, in reinforcement learning in PumDB tasks, and still does. Uh, there are lots of applications like that where neuroevolution is powerful. Uh, but since a couple of years ago, a new role for neuroevolution has started to emerge, uh, and that is in uh, conjunction with uh, deep learning and, and uh, gradient descent. And that is an optimization of these network designs that are then trained in a second phase with uh, uh, backpropagation or, or gradient descent. So, <clears throat> so we can evolve several aspects of these neural networks, architecture, hyperparameters, uh, activation functions, loss functions, and so on. Um, and that is the general framework for the neural net, general design. And then the weights of the neural network are, um, are then tra uh, trained with backprop. And the power here comes from uh, complexity, that we can come up with very complex designs that would be difficult to come up with by, by hand. Um, now, a third possible role is that there's an interesting um, question in biology in general, like how did intelligent uh, behavior evolve? Now, how did it come out in biology? And we could address that uh, by using neuroevolution, evolving uh, bodies and brains together, and also evolving systems that learn and develop uh, and this way we could address some big questions uh, in cognitive science, like memory and language and learning and so on. Um, so there the techniques, evol evolution neural networks, and perhaps combined with some learning can be used to address cognitive science questions. And it's a unique technique and unique approach uh, to that area. Okay, so these are actually the three topics that we'll, we'll uh, cover today in this tutorial. Uh, we'll start with the um, with the sequential decision task and then look at optimization on neural architecture search and then uh, some of these cognitive science issues. <clears throat> so, uh, sequential decision tasks first. Um, the general problem here is that uh, you have a decision making system, um, some kind of a control or maybe uh, behavior, uh, maybe decision making, um, and your decisions generate a sequence of states. Uh, and the states may be only partially known, like you don't really know everything that's going on in the game. Uh, and certainly we don't know what the optimal outputs are, what the optimal decisions are. Um, we can only tell how well we are doing. Like we're playing the game for a while, we know how often we win or what our score is, but not exactly what those actions were that led to that score. Um, and these kinds of uh, situation exist in many uh, real world domains, um, all kinds of control domains, robots, vehicles, traffic, uh, manufacturing, uh, computer design, process optimization, um, and then also, also behaviors like game playing and various artificial life questions and, and biology questions as well. So sequence of decision tasks are everywhere. Um, now, <clears throat> the standard approach um, for a long time has been value function-based reinforcement learning, uh, where you make several decisions and eventually you observe the outcome, maybe you win the game, and then you um, try to associate Good, uh, some good values for actions that led to the, the win. Um, so the central piece here is a function approximator that looks at the state 
two sensors, senses where we are, and then uh, considers a decision and assigns a value for that action in that state. Uh, now, this is great, it's, it, but it is quite difficult. Uh, in many cases, the sensors, decisions, and, and uh, are, are continuous. Um, this works very well when you have a tabular situation, when you can enumerate the states and, and enumerate the decisions and then associate a value for particular a location in a table. But if it's continuous, it's a lot harder. Uh, but in particular, it's very hard if you don't know where you are. If your sensors don't tell you exactly what your state is, it's, it's, it's hard to learn a value and associate it with anything because you don't know where you are. Uh, and that is where the PalmDB challenge comes in. Uh, you don't observe the state fully, you don't know where you are, and it's difficult to learn uh, with value function um, reinforcement learning. Uh, now, there are some policy search um, techniques, and certainly evol neuroevolution falls under the same kind of a, a approach. The idea is that your sensors approximately recognize the state, and then your neural net um, predicts what the right decision might be. Uh, it looks at the state and guesses a probabili probabilistically what the right decision might be. Uh, and this is a, a policy optimization. There are some standard techniques like reinforced from 90s and generally policy gradients. Um, and that works relatively well in simple cases like the one on the left. Uh, if you assume that you have one such solution in reinforcement learning, you, you climb the nearest hill. Uh, you modify like reinforce it, it senses the gradient around it uh, and then climbs the hill. Uh, but obviously you can get stuck with some local minima. You have to restart. And that works relatively well still if you have a simple case like that. <clears throat> but on the right, that's more like it. That's more like many, many real world problems are like this. There are many possible solutions and, and it is difficult to find the ones that really lead to the highest peak. Um, so um, this is an approach that can work to simple cases, but not so much in a very, very challenging domains um, uh, in PomDB. Now, this is where neuroevolution comes in. Uh, the main difference from policy search is that we take advantage of populations. Uh, it's a population-based search method. So instead of having a single individual whose job is to climb the nearest hill, like in the previous picture, it's like a slice of that landscape. We have a population, multiple agents, uh, multiple uh, solutions uh, scattered around the uh, search space as, as broadly as possible. Uh, and then we have multiple parallel searches that are happening at the same time. Um, and each of these discovers some building blocks that are then combined in order to find something better. So we might have a solution here, a solution here, and then we do a recombination and actually find that peak. Uh, that's the basic idea. Now, <clears throat> this is important. Uh, the population gives you the power that uh, standard reinforcement learning does not have. It allows you to explore more broadly uh, because you can hedge your bets. You can afford to try solutions that are not necessarily that good because they might still find some building blocks that combine to, to give you really good solutions. And the scale of this is staggering. I mean, there are examples of finding solutions in a space that's this big, two to the two to the 70th states. This is a 70-bit multiplexer design if you frame it as a search problem. Uh, and it turns out that number is very, very uh, concise here, but if you write it out as a decimal number, it takes light 95 years to go from the beginning of the number to the end of the number. That's the number of states in which you are searching. And you can still find it uh, using evolution because you are finding these building blocks and then recombining them and gradually making progress. Um, and similarly, uh, there are examples where very high dimensional spaces can be searched like uh, Kalimoy Depp's um, metal alloy optimization, billion variables at once. Uh, you can optimize in order to find, find good states. And any other techniques that we look at some of those that allow you to get around these, these valleys to the highest peaks. When, when the landscape is deceptive, you can still, the population can still make progress. Um, so these are, this is what evolution gives you. It allows you to scale up the search uh, that uh, the standard reinforcement learning uh, does not because you have a population, you have these techniques that take advantage of it. So that's the big motivation uh, for you doing neuroevolution in PalmDB tasks. Um, and how well does it work? Well, quite well. Uh, here we go to some of the standard benchmark domains uh, in the OpenAI gym uh, card poll uh, benchmark uh, and compared to PPO and DQN, some of the standard reinforcement learning techniques. And you can see that uh, neuroevolution techniques here, the blue um, performs better, it converges faster and has much lower variance and also lower regret. So the cost of uh, experimentation is lower. Uh, so in that sense, you come up with solutions 
more efficiently and, and it's more reliable to find them and, and it's also safer to search for them. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and there are many different benchmark uh, comparisons like this that demonstrate the same, same thing. Uh, and <clears throat> a neural evolution is, as far as we know, currently the only method that can find solutions to very challenging such benchmarks like double bowl, pole where uh, the pole lengths are relatively uh, similar, uh, POMDB task, that's uh, reinforcement learning cannot handle that, but uh, neural evolution can because it is exploring so much, uh, so much more than the standard reinforcement learning. Uh, so that's a motivation uh, for doing neural evolution in POMDB tasks. So how do we set it up? How do we actually do it? Well, here's one example. Um, we have input variables here for the neural network that encode the state through these sensors. So this might be a game agent in some kind of a level, uh, sensing enemies, sensing walls, uh, sensing whether its weapon is on target, whether the enemy is firing at it. Uh, and then at the outputs, it turning left, right, going forward, backwards, and firing a weapon. A very simple network it can evolve to be much more complex, <clears throat> but its decisions are based on sensors, make those actions. Uh, and when you evolve the topology, it can become recurrent, and that gives you the memory that allows you to disambiguate the state. That's how you can deal with POMDB tasks. Um, so the basic idea of how you evolve neural networks is relatively simple. It's, it's exactly what you would expect. Uh, you take uh, the weights of the neural network and you concatenate them. Uh, so if, if you could encode them with bits, for instance. So the first four bits uh, from the first input to the first hidden node, and then first input to the second hidden node and so on. Um, you just concatenate them. Usually, instead of bit strings, we would use uh, real valued uh, weights, uh, but the idea is still the same. You concatenate the weights of the network and the structure of the network remains the same. Uh, and initially, you um, make the weights random, uh, and then you have a population of such encodings and run your usual crossover and mutation to create new networks, test them in the environment to measure hit and the, the fitness and, and run your uh, crossover imitation to get new, new networks. Um, and why this works um, is actually interesting that it makes sense. Uh, these operations of crossover and mutation, they make sense in, in, uh, in a phenotypic space. So you're taking two networks and kind of cutting them and then gluing them back together and you get another network. So part of your network is good and from one parent and another person is, another part of the network is good from another parent and then the combination is better than both parents. So it, these operations, evolutionary search makes sense in the space of neural networks. Um, and that, uh, that is already a big win. Just the simplest possible encoding, this concatenation of weights, sort of conventional neural evolution already works quite well. Um, but we can do more than that. And for quite a while, since the 90s and 2000s or so, uh, people have developed better methods uh, for evolving these neural networks. Uh, one of them is, to evolve components of networks and then putting them together systematically. So here's one such idea. Uh, instead of having the genomes represent entire neural networks, um, you have subpopulation and each subpopulation supplies just one neuron uh, for the network. Uh, so you pick one from each subpopulation and you get a full network. Each neuron comes with its own weights so that they connect together to form a network. Uh, this is called ESP by Dino Gomez. Um, and, and here, there are lots of reasons why this actually works well. Um, we, uh, we have smaller populations. Uh, we have uh, no uh, uh, problem of, con uh, of uh, competing conventions because the uh, neurons end up in the same kind of situation and uh, same kind of location. And therefore, the search is more efficient. Um, and this same idea of evolving partial solutions and combining them can be applied at different levels. We can do it at the level of layers. We can do it at the level of connections uh, with a little bit of restrictions of what kind of search we do. Uh, and, and, it, and then we can also add a blueprint on top of this uh, structure that tells you which neurons to actually pick uh, in order to form the network. But the basic idea is the same. You evolve sub-solutions or partial solutions and then form um, bigger solutions um, by combining them. Uh, and this actually works quite well, and it's interesting to see what is being discovered. So if you take these populations and you encode each neuron uh, in 2D by doing a principal component analysis, perhaps to reduce the dimensionality, so each weight vector of each neuron is now in a dot, dot in 2D. 
Um, and then you color the subpopulations according to um, uh, where they are. Now we have initially random weights. So the, all the subpopulations are mixed. Uh, but early on in generation, uh, on, in, in evolution, they start to diverge. And you start to see that the subpopulation, uh, subpopulations develop different specialties. Um, so this is a task where a neural network controlled a little Kepera robot in simulation, uh, bumping into walls and trying to find a, its way through a maze. And if you look at what each of these subpopulations are doing, you take a neuron there, and it might be a neuron that slows the robot down if it's approaching a wall. Uh, and another subpopulation might veer the robot to the right if there's a wall on the left, and, and vice versa, something like that. And it turns out that you can identify the subpopulations are actually developing specializations, different subfunctions. And when you form a network by pulling one neuron from each subpopulation, you get something that's functional. Uh, and not only that, each subpopulation has a primary function and something else. So if you pick a bad neuron, there are some other neurons that can take over that function that's otherwise wouldn't be well coded. So it's a very robust encoding. Um, and this way, diversity emerges automatically uh, because you cannot have all the networks neurons be the same. They have to have different sub, uh, specialties. Uh, and you don't have competing conventions because you have uh, each neuron supply a different uh, function. Uh, and you have smaller search base. And this is what makes this, this approach work. Um, now, another kind of an advanced technique, um, although it's already a couple of decades old since it started, is uh, using uh, CMAES. CMAES is a very good approach for uh, continuous optimization. And it can be applied to optimizing weights, you know, continuous values. Um, this is quite different from what we looked at before. Um, there are small populations, there's no crossover, but instead there are intelligent mutations. Uh, and, and CMAS is very well suited for neuroevolution because um, you do have interactions between those weights. And that's exactly what the covariance co matrix captures. So it gives you a good idea of what works and therefore CMAS uh, is able to make progress in neuroevolution quite well. And again, you have a smaller search space and less convergence and fewer conventions when you, when you apply that. So it's a quite powerful approach for optimizing weights of the neural network directly. Now, third way of um, evolving neural networks, kind of, kind of a category of, of, of methods, is to evolve the network structure. Try to take advantage uh, of, the, of the recurrent structure of the network and customize it to your task. Uh, and it's, of course, it's quite a big uh, dimension. Uh, it's not just that you optimize weights, but you also optimize how the ne neurons are connected. Um, so uh, NEAT is one such method, and there's been many implementations over the years. This is originally Ken Stanley's work. Um, it's based on the idea of complexification. So you start with a simple neural network, like maybe inputs directly connected to the outputs. And then over evolution, you complexify. You add more genes to the genome, and that means you add more nodes in your network and you add recurrent connections, like these little loops and so on. You gradually make the networks more complex. So uh, at the same time as your networks complexify, your behavior complexifies. But what is really important here is that the simple network is still there underneath and we are just elaborating it. We're not replacing it. And this is this would make makes it possible. You are always in a good place to start and you are trying to improve it. You elaborating the behavior, building upon what already works, and that gives you a lot of power discovering complex functions. And as a matter of fact, we did the following experiment. Um, we first evolved um, these networks to control these little Kepera robots in a robotic dual task, um, um, foraging and finding en and, and gathering energy and then bumping into the other robot when, uh, when you had more energy. And, and the controllers became very complex. Uh, their behaviors were, were very complex. They were uh, they were estimating the time that it takes to get to a target and how much energy they spend and how much the opponent spends. So it's a very complex decision-making problem with a lot of re recurrency. Um, and, and this is one of the best networks that uh, evolved. So now an experiment, take this network architecture and generate a new population using the same structure, but randomized weights. Now it should be easy for evolution to find the weight values because the network architecture is already there. We know that this architecture, this topology works. It's just a matter of finding the right weights. Um, and it turns out it's actually harder. It's very hard. The evolution that we ran could not find the weight values for that network. It could only find the right weight values 
if it started simple and gradually complexified and eventually got to that network. Um, the simpler networks already had their weight set up and already had much of the behavior. And it was necessary in the next step in evolution just to uh, improve on that, elaborate on that. And you actually were always focusing the evolution and learning into in the smaller pieces of the net. And that's how you find complex solutions. So this incremental construction of intelligent agents is a very powerful idea. And that's what, uh, what need captures and allows you to come up with uh, small networks that are uh, customized uh, to certain tasks perform well in complex behavior. All right, um, fourth advanced uh, technique and still uh, I think part of the future work in this area uh, is to utilize indirect encodings. Um, so, so far what we've had in all of these cases is that you look at the genome and a part of the genome maps one-to-one -one and part of the phenotype of neural network. So there's a one-to-one -one, one -one mapping between the genome and phenotypes. But um, nature doesn't work that way. Um, and we could take the hint from the nature and uh, evolve a, a something like a process that then uh, uh, when it unfolds, it creates your, your final network. So for instance, cellular encoding was one of the early ideas of that kind, Graham Wetley. Uh, and here, it's more of a grammar kind of encoding that you are evolving these trees uh, that uh, consist of instructions on how to construct a neural net. Um, so we start with a prototype, which is just input to output and an ancestor cell. And then you read these instructions in order to uh, construct a net. So this is a sequential division in this direction, and then a parallel division horizontally, another sequential division, another parallel division. So now you have these two layers. Uh, and then you add one to the threshold and invert the weight. So there's a negative weight um, and higher threshold. And you got the network, and these are end markers, and you got the network like that. This is an XOR network. So this is a grammatical express expression of how you construct an XOR network. And you could extend it with a recurrency symbol so that you have a two bit parity, four, three, four, five, and so on. So it's a really good approach for creating networks that have repeatable uh, regular structure. Um, but philosophically, what we have is we are, have a genome that describes a developmental process. And that, of course, is something that we see in biology. We have a starting point and then a develop, developmental process that then construct the final, uh, final individual. And that's what we're trying to capture here. And it's a powerful idea. Um, now, there are other ways of doing indirect encodings. Uh, this is HyperNeat, an extension of NEAT where um, the NEAT evolved neural network simply assigns weights for another network that then, then performs a task. Um, so here we need a substrate for the actual action network. And substrate means that neurons are uh, embedded in certain locations. They have X and Y coordinates. And then when you give an X and, the X and Y coordinates of a connection, so source neuron and the target neuron, those are inputs. Then the network gives you the output, which is the weight on that connection. And this way you can specify the weights of an entire network. And you can, you can scale this. You can have a five by five network or 500 by 500 network. And this same uh, neat evolved neural network can give those weights because it's receiving the coordinates of the uh, input and output units as its, as its input. Uh, and the idea is that these networks evolve to generate patterns that are somewhat regular. And, and that turns out to be powerful. For instance, in visual tasks, you have this kind of repeatable function. This is not so far from convolutional network and you can actually evolve something like that as well. Uh, and it turns out to be surprisingly powerful. These kind of regular principled neural networks with repeatable structure are powerful in many tasks. Um, so, Indirect encodings have some very appealing properties, much smaller search space. Um, and uh, you, again, avoid competing conventions. And you can describe classes of networks very efficiently. Uh, you can have modular structures and reuse them, um, which is very much motivated by, by biology. Um, now, it's not yet fully explored. This is something where future work could really make a difference. Um, it's hard to use these indirect methods and do better than the direct methods. Uh, but biology is using indirect methods as a good reason to study them and try to figure out what we are missing. Um, and there are things that we are missing like genetic regulatory networks. We can model those directly. It's not that the genes map directly to uh, the proteins. There's a complex network of interactions between, um, between the expressions uh, and that can be modeled. Um, 
we can take advantage of symmetries or more general L systems, um, spatial coding to scale up, many different ideas and in how indirect encodings could be uh, explored uh, so that we can, we can develop uh, more powerful uh, neuroevolution methods. So this is one main direction of future work in, in neuroevolution today. Um, now, there are many other techniques uh, for evolving neural networks. Uh, and I'm just mentioning a bunch of them here, but the literature is quite big actually. Uh, and we even have a, you know, special sessions in, in conferences like Gecko now for neuroevolution only. Uh, and uh, this is, this is uh, becoming a quite, a quite a fruitful area of research of its own. Um, so we can um, apply neuroevolution quite naturally to incremental and multi-objective evolution. Um, look at behaviors in the population in order to inform selection and, and, um, and uh, fitness sharing and so on. Um, look at the entire history of evaluations in order to get more information of what works. Uh, we can decide what is the proper level of um, crossover and mutation, ensembles, modules, as well as, like I said, downwards all the way to uh, connections. Uh, we can evolve other aspects of neural networks and weights and topologies like like the activation functions, uh, learning rules, loss functions, and so on. Um, we can have an optimization of the neural evolution method itself and the two levels of interacting evolutions. Um, different kinds of architectures like LSTMs, uh, positive transformers, um, they are very complex designs and we can evolve those. Um, and one of the interesting interactions is to combine learning and evolution that's the part we talk about in the, in the second piece when we talk about deep learning. Um, now, another interesting um, idea that has emerged in the last you know, five, 10 years or so is evolving for novelty. Um, so not just to evolve neural networks that perform well, but evolve neural networks that are different from other networks. Let's look at that because that's quite a bit of, uh, bit of fun. Um, so the initial motivation perhaps uh, at least to some of people, uh, came from this, this uh, example. This is the big breeder application. And there's also a 3D version of it called Endless Forms, um, Ken Stanley and Jeff Kloon. Um, the idea here is to evolve images, evolve pictures that are interesting. Um, now, what we're actually evolving is these pattern producing neural nets, the same neural nets that are used in Hypernet. Um, and their output now is actually pixel values and color values on pixels. Um, but the interesting bit is that this is actually a game on the web and people can go here and they can tell which images they like and then evolution recombines them and mutates them to give new images. So in a sense, evolution gives you generation and humans do the selection. Now what happens here is that evolution starts with some simple images and people pick them and, and the humans don't necessarily have a goal of what they wanna evolve. They just look at the images that are fun and then something interesting comes out. And then maybe at that point, you select the images that are closer to something that you have in mind. So uh, for instance, we get landscapes, uh, we get all kinds of insects uh, and even bigger animals like a pig here. Uh, and uh, here's a fashion shoe and there's a, a compound eye and there's a dolphin and, and a whole earth uh, planet. Uh, so there's quite a bit of variety of what you can get um, although there's still a kind of an artistic quality to it, Big Breeder has a, a style, this sort of a dreamy, continuous, smooth uh, images, even though they are of, of various topics. It's really nice. It's kind of artistic. Uh, now, um, but the important bit here is that this is all serendipitous. The humans don't really have an idea that I'm going to evolve a butterfly. Even if you tried to, it would be really hard. But you, you get the butterfly because you are somewhere doing something else and then you realize, oh, there's an opportunity to do a butterfly. Now, this may be similar to actual biological evolution. Bio biology does not have a goal. It's not that somehow biological evolution decides to evolve flight. It happens because there are multiple small steps uh, and then um, uh, do, from those stepping stones, you get something that uh, eventually will, will develop flight. Um, so it's, it's, again, it's an opportunity that emerges, not that it's towards their goal. And even if you try to evolve something with a goal in mind, it would be very hard. So for instance, if you try to evolve uh, using the CPPN evolution, the skull, one of the images that was there in, um, in, in the game, uh, and you can try it multiple times and just giving the fitness at how far you are from the, cult, from the skull, like maybe pixel by pixel 
distance. It's very hard. There's four experiments here. Uh, they all run out of steam. This one has the forehead, general shape of the head, maybe some of the ideas that there are some eyes or holes there, but they are nothing like the skull. Evolution runs out of steam because you are trying to make incremental progress towards that image. And that turns out to be a very difficult way of solving this complex design problem. But if you look at the history of evolution that actually constructed the skull with humans acting as the selection mechanism, you see that at one point there was a, there was a crescent moon. And another point there was like, um, I don't know, a water droplet. Uh, and then you started to see a little bit of a shape of a head. And then from there on a couple of generations later, actually quite a few, you get the skull. So these images in the middle are nothing like the skull, but they are still interesting and they serve as stepping stones. And when you eventually recombine some of those stepping stones, you get something that looks like a skull. So this is the insight that evolution uh, of these complex things like complex images does not proceed incrementally directly linearly towards the goal. It proceeds in all kinds of different directions. And then those stepping stones that are interesting to some degree on their own right, then give you those big jumps that, like the skull. Um, so here's an idea of that there's a demo that illustrates that idea uh, of stepping stones. So this is an artificial domain. Fitness is zero in the background and it's non-zero on those crowd's feet. Uh, and uh, the lighter the color, the higher the fitness. So the population starts here and there's random exploration until you hit one of those, uh, those high fitness areas. Uh, and then uh, there's more exploration on that. Once you have reached the end of that uh, toe and the other toe in the X direction, you can recombine these two solutions to jump to the next high fitness area. And there again, you, you explore and jump to the next one and to the next one. So this is an illustration of stepping stone. Each one of these uh, extreme toes is a stepping stone. Once you reach that ultimate stepping stone, you can recombine two stepping stones in order to make a jump. And that's what we see here in this, uh, in this animation. So indeed, you got this one and you're waiting for the other one. Once you have that, you jump to the next one. You got this one, you're waiting for evolution to uh, discover the other end of the toe. And now you make a jump to the next one. And same thing here, the fitness is twice as high in the X direction. That's why you find the solutions in X first before you, you find them in Y. But once you find them in Y, you make the jump to the next one. So again, stepping stones allow you to get further. Um, and this is, this is the basic idea of novelty search. What if we simply reward novelty, reward exploration, reward new ideas, uh, new kinds of solutions? We can explore the space more efficiently and then find these stepping stones that then, then uh, can be recombined to come up with good solutions. And it's surprising that you can find solutions to even quite difficult problems just by rewarding novelty. No, no fitness at all. Uh, just do as much exploration and find as much novelty as you can. So here's an example of that. This is on bipedal walking, Joel Lehman's work. Um, this is a fitness-based evolution of bipedal walker. And as you can see, it's kind of stiff, it's kind of slow, uh, and eventually it fails when it, it gets out of balance. And, and here is one that was discovered by uh, novelty search. Uh, and it is, is much better, oops, much more natural. It makes this lean, it leans forward and then it moves legs quite strongly and walks quite fast and walks quite robustly. And this is just simply found in the population that was discovering novel solutions. So, so how is this even possible? I mean, why do you land on these solutions that are actually meaningful uh, when, when um, nothing tells you what is actually high fitness? And it turns out, if you think about it, that in order to be novel, in order to be very different from other solutions, you probably have to understand something about the domain uh, so that you can make a large jump. Like here in, in this um, evolution, one way to be novel is to take a couple of steps and then fall flat on your face. Well, that eventually then allows you to make more steps and get further, which is different from falling flat. And this way you can find these stepping stones and eventually one of those stepping stones is this, this bipedal walker that's very fast. I mean, humans still have to go there and find in that field of, of, of solutions that are novel, some that are interesting like this one. 
Uh, but evolution deal, does land on those interesting solutions because they capture powerful ways of being different. And some of them actually are really interesting and useful like this bipedal walker. So that's the idea of novel search. Uh, and there's lots of current work in, in trying to make, take advantage of this. Uh, and in particular, to one way or another, combine it with fitness so you can automatically select those directions that are more likely to be useful. So novelty search is still the workhorse, but then you add some kind of quality diversity metric there. Uh, you also measure quality, not just diversity, uh, in order to find solutions that are better than others. Uh, so that's current work, and there's quite a bit uh, that can be done in that direction still. And this is what gives, again, um, power to evolution compared to some of the other methods. It allows you to explore wildly while still being the, uh, keeping the exploration relevant to what your task is. Um, so there are numerous applications of, of neuroevolution. Uh, this is listing a bunch of them. Um, control, robotics, games, and artificial life. Uh, there are things like uh, controlling um, a satellite assistant in a space shuttle bay, uh, controlling a finless rocket. So these are relatively low level control tasks where the control is highly nonlinear and complex. Um, various robotics, automated driving, uh, multi-legged walking, for instance. Uh, and neuroevolution has been used in games quite a bit, behavior in games, like for instance, uh, Pac-Man um, or even video games. I'll show you an example in a minute, or Othello, board games. And then various questions in artificial life, uh, for instance, uh, herding and hunting. Um, and um, I'll show you an example of evolving the body together with the brain in order to be something believable. So this is quite a wide field of different applications. Um, and uh, let's look at some of those uh, that are on the right side here as, a, as, as a powerful examples. Um, so the first one is, is games. Um, and the goal here is to evolve not just behavior that, mm, that is effective in the game, but behavior that feels human-like. Um, so there's a good motivation, good reason for that kind of uh, goal. Um, it's more fun to play games against other players that are like humans. It's fun to beat your friends, of course, in games, but having, <laughs> if you can't have that, it's, it's better to play against artificial agents that play like other humans. Um, now, this was an idea that we had early on, um, with the, with the community did, uh, and like 2005, we started thinking about, could we make a competition out of it? Um, so that the goal would be to uh, be indistinguishable from humans. So Phil Hingston ran with his idea and set up the competition and uh, raised some funding for, for the prizes. Uh, and the competition ran for five years. Um, and when we started 2007, uh, it wasn't that easy. <laughs> and it still isn't, of course, but, but it was, it, we didn't know whether it was possible and whether we could even uh, find, find the winners, whether there were any differences. Uh, so it's quite brave. Um, but it turned out to work out quite well. Um, so the setup is an Unreal Tournament a video game, which is a shoot 'em up game, um, multiple levels, multiple players. But in this case, it was set up so that there were only three players in one level. Um, there, one player was a human, um, human confederate, we called it, uh, that tries to play the game to win, like normal gameplay. Uh, and then the second player is a software bot that tries to play like humans, pretend to be a human. And the third player is a human player, but uh, their job, the third player's job, is to distinguish between the bot and human. So engage them in various uh, ways and then decide which one is a human and which one is a bot. Um, so it's like a Turing test for game bots. There's no verbal communication. It's all uh, moving around, picking weapons, attacking, taking cover, behaviors like that in a game. Uh, and it turns out that there are very mechanical ways of doing that, that AI in the game usually use, which makes the game not so much fun. Uh, and then behaviors that humans use and, and makes, it, makes it more fun. So this is the setup. Uh, now, uh, there are lots of dimensions of behavior and most of those can be handled by, by simply behavior trees or lists. Uh, but what's really important is of course the fighting behavior when you're nearby uh, engaging in one-on-one -on -one battle like that. What you do at that point gives a good uh, impression, whether you're a bot or a human. So that fighting behavior was evolved um, in our approach and, and most of the other behaviors were simply programmed up. Um, now, when the game, when the competition started 2007 and all the way to 2011, there was a persistent gap. Uh, humans were much more human-like than bots. 
Uh, bots were just about one quarter of the time they were just to be human, versus humans were three quarters of the time just to be human. So, and that gap was quite wide. And it wasn't really going away very much. Um, now, when we looked into like what was going on, what was the problem? Um, and we realized that when you are evolving uh, the behavior to be good, efficient, effective, uh, you end up with bots that behave very uh, efficiently, but not human-like. For instance, they might run at full speed and at the same time shoot as accurately as they can, uh, and very accurately. Humans can do that. Humans can really perform one task, and, and if, if they try to do something else at the same time, it's, it's going to be less effective. Um, and also the other things like uh, the bots, uh, AI typically can react immediately if something strange happens. Humans take a while to understand what's going on before they react. They can be startled, for instance. Um, so there are these limitations that humans have uh, and bots did not have them. And that's what made them apparently less human-like. So we changed our approach and we gave these bots the same kind of limitations as humans have, um, reaction times. Um, and uh, ability to perform only one task at, at, at any one time, and so on. Uh, and that turned out to be a big, uh, big difference. Uh, so in 2012, uh, when we uh, evolved uh, neural networks under those constraints, we actually got to the point that, um, that uh, reached the 50% mark. So half the time, the bots were just to be human. Um, also, the bots were just to be human, uh, more human than half the human players, which is which was really remarkable, I think more remarkable, because then you're really in the ballpark of human players. And it's kind of depressing for the humans who were just to be less human than a bot. But, uh, but that's life. Um, now let's look at um, an example of, of the bot playing. You are looking at the game from the judges perspective, and you're engaging one player here, 932. Uh, and by moving around, shooting, picking weapons, taking cover, you can observe what the bot is doing, what the opponent is doing. Uh, and now at this point, uh, we switch to another opponent. Uh, the first one went to lick his wounds or something. And uh, now we are engaging the other player, 144. Does this look different? Does 144 look more human or less human? Well, we get to test our uh, hypothesis again by engaging 932 again, the first opponent again uh, in close quarters. We can see uh, what the reactions are. Is this again more human than 144? Well, let's look at 144 again. It comes back and we can engage it. And we now see what's, what's happening against this, um, this uh, opponent. Uh, and in the end, now make a judgment. Is 932 the bot or uh, is 144 the bot? Well, you can take a guess. It uh, turns out 932 was the bot. And, and usually when I ask is in a, with a live audience, I get about 50-50, which is pretty much what, what we got in the competition. Uh, and that was the level of, of, of being a human-like, uh, meaning the Turing test. Now, it doesn't mean that we, of course, exhausted everything that can be done. There are still challenges in being human-like. Uh, we still have a situation that many times the humans can judge um, an opponent to be a bot or a human in just a couple of seconds. I mean, you're walking somewhere and, and the opponent comes in front of you and you engage in a couple of exchanges and they go away, just in like two seconds, four seconds. And statistically, the humans are relatively reliable in judging whether something was a human or bot. But they cannot tell you why. <laughs> it, it, humans are terrible at explaining their actions. They actually even remember it wrong and explain the wrong way if you ask them. Um, we did that kind of a human study and learned nothing from it. Um, and there are also situations where the judges can lay traps. So they engage the opponent and then they run around the corner and wait there in an ambush. Uh, and the bot falls for it, falls for it again, falls for it the third time. <laughs> they never learn, humans would. So that's a clear uh, distinction of humans and, and bots. And we don't have that ability yet in our opponents, uh, in our, our bots. Um, so there's still quite a bit to, to do. Uh, there's some um, um, ideas of trials of building a team competition also, like acting together as a human team and, and line, trying to look like a human team. So there's quite a bit more work that can be done uh, in this domain to look human-like. But we already learned quite a bit. We learned that in order to get human-like behavior, we have to take into account uh, human restrictions. And then when you optimize under those restrictions, you get behavior that's relatively uh, believable. 
Um, okay, so that was the first part of, of the tutorial, uh, evolving um, behavior, in particular PomDB behavior, sequential behavior, uh, making it human-like. Um, and uh, this has been the mainstay of neuroevolution for quite a while, and as you can see, it continues, and we'll come back to it a little bit when we talk about um, evolution of intelligence. But uh, let's now switch gears and uh, talk about uh, a topic of combining uh, evolution with a deep learning. Uh, and this is, an, like I said, new emerging field for about five years, it's been happening and, and it's going very strong. There are lots of ideas here um, and, um, and they're making an, an impact in, in the current state of the art in deep learning. Um, now, of course, we know where deep learning came from. It was lots of ideas that were already there in the 90s, but only when we had enough compute, million times more compute than we had in the 90s, uh, these ideas started to work. Things like convolution and, uh, and LSTMs and, and other ideas like that. Um, and the idea is that we have a very large neural network design, many, many layers. Um, and for a long time, the early deep learning uh, performance was just getting better and better when you added more and more layers. Uh, and we are now up to hundreds of layers in, in some of these models. Um, so now a new problem has started to emerge. How do you configure such systems? They become so complex. Uh, in some cases, we have some principles like in this inception network, we have a module that repeats multiple times. And, you, and same thing with ResNet, you repeat the residual block hundreds of times and you get a powerful network. Um, but there's also different kinds of architectures that are needed for different kinds of tasks. And, and the question is, how do you come up with them? Um, now, this is not just a problem in um, deep learning and evolution computation. In general, in engineering design, in many areas, we have reached the limit of what humans can do, what they can keep in their head and optimize in their head so we can get uh, good solutions. Um, in order to find an kind of illustration of that, I went to the web and looked for something that was an engineering design, and I found this image, and I think it's really great. Uh, it shows you some engineering design in some domain uh, with lots of interacting components. I don't know what it is, but I know that it's simplified. So <laughs> that's, a, that's a problem. If this is a simplified design, how the heck can you ever optimize it? Um, so there is an, an idea emerging that we should actually use automated methods. Of course, in VLSI design, we've used automated and, and uh, mechanical optimization for quite a while already. But in engineering design more generally, it might be a good idea that humans come up with a overall framework. And then we use something like evolution optimization uh, to design the details of that, uh, that uh, solution. Um, and or even, even an idea like Holger Hus has that we could do uh, programming by optimization. Then we just write kind of pseudocode at the high level and then evolution is used to, fi used to fill in the, the holes. And also Stephanie Forrest has shown that we can fix bugs and come up with non-trivial programs that way. So this is a general idea of configuring complex systems by using optimization. Um, here's one kind of compelling example of, of what, uh, what that might be like. Uh, this is the helicopter hovering benchmark. Uh, initially, it was a reinforcement learning benchmark um, by, I think, Peter Abiel. And um, now, uh, Shimon Weizen and Roger Kapishan applied evolution to it um, and also complexified it quite a bit. So here's actually the helicopter. It's upside down. Turns out a toy helicopter can fly uh, upside down. and. Uh, and uh, when, when um, Shimon and Roger used it, they optimized eight parameters of evolutionary neuroevolution of parameters by hand in order to come up with a good solution. Now, if you are optimizing those parameters by evolution instead, optimizing the configuration of the learning system uh, by evolution, you can increase the number of parameters. Um, in, in this case, just about double it. So with EA, with evolution, we increased it to 15 parameters, different parts of evolution computation, like what's the mutation rate, what's the mutation uh, range, the initial uh, population, all kinds of parameters, 15 different parameters that configure uh, the evolution system and neuroevolution system. Turns out you get significantly better performance just by opening up, making the problem bigger, uh, higher dimensional, um, too high for humans to optimize, but still evolution can optimize and you can get better performance. So that's the, that's the promise uh, of this kind of a meta learning uh, approach where you have very complex learning systems and you optimize their setup 
using evolution. Okay, so let's apply these ideas now to designing deep learning architectures. Um, and the challenge here is that different tasks require different networks. So you can do better if you customize the task, uh, the structure to the task. So the structure matters. This is, for instance, image um, recognition task or uh, question answering task or uh, image captioning task. And they have very different architectures. Uh, and these architectures are too complex to be discovered by hand. Um, now the question is, can we discover principles of organization and can we cover enough of the search space in order to find really good architectures? Uh, and the evolutionary search is well suited for this uh, problem. Uh, the population-based search covers much of the search space. Um, there are crossovers and, and mutation that then disco can discover principles. Uh, and we have novelty search that allows us to explore broadly. Um, and these ideas that are very developed to the BOMDB type of neuroevolution, weight and topology evolution, they actually apply at the level of architecture search as well. Um, like for instance, subpopulations and, and uh, uh, discovering right kind of topologies and, and evolutionary uh, strategies and so on. They all apply at the level of neuroarchitecture search. But here we have multiple different targets that we could evolve and optimize. So hyperparameters is one thing, like uh, number of filters, channels, um, and uh, sizes of layers and so on. Um, the structure of nodes, like this one is an LSTM node, non-linearities inside LSTM, uh, modules, from which you construct networks. And here's a whole topology consisting of multiple mo modules. So you can evolve both. And also structures of multitask networks that combine learning from multiple data sets. All of these can be evolved uh, and uh, this way discover more complex structure that you could do by hand. Um, now, there's been quite a bit of work in this area already uh, over the last five years or so. And there's some fundamental uh, discoveries. For instance, the Uber group, uh, as well as the OpenAI, um, the researchers have compared uh, this kind of evolution architecture search to uh, other methods. Um, and for instance, uh, they discovered that evolutionary search is doing more exploration than gradient-based search. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, also genetic algorithms can do more exploration than evolutionary strategies. And this is important in finding, uh, of course, innovation and things that are new and different. Um, now, the Google Brain Group, um, Espan Real and uh, Coquille, for instance, uh, they looked at scaling up this approach to image net size. And they discovered by with some, some uh, regularization techniques and automatic expansion of the size, um, network architectures that actually, at the time anyway, performed uh, at state-of-the-art level. They were the best image net uh, image recognition systems uh, found by evolution compared to, for instance, reinforcement learning and, and random search. Um, now, one idea uh, that allows you to do this more efficiently is population-based training from DeepMind. Uh, Max Zetterberg and others. The idea is that you are continuously training the networks as well as evolving its, uh, its hyperparameters. And this way be more efficient. Um, there are ideas that expand neuroevolution beyond the, just the topologies and, and, and design principles to other components of, of a neural network. Uh, for instance, activation functions or loss functions, or even the entire learning algorithm can be evolved. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about this more in my uh, CC um, keynote. And there are some papers that got uh, Gecko this year that uh, talk about loss function optimization, for instance. Um, so this way, co-evolving multiple aspects of network design might actually be the big direction in the future. Um, and I will think we'll hear much more about it in, um, in the next uh, few years. Uh, but let's look at some of the basic principles of evolving um, these deep learning systems. Um, so here's uh, one idea, Code Neat, um, uh, Jason Liang and others. Uh, idea here is to take the uh, ESP that we talked about earlier, uh, where you evolve neurons and then put them together to networks. Uh, and also the same system that was uh, Dave Moriarty's work a long time ago um, of evolving blueprints on how you actually combine those elements. So here we have, um, multiple subpopulation, and each one evolves a module, a, a small fragment of a neural network, a deep learning neural network with some layers and connections between them. At the same time, we evolve a blueprint that tells you how you use these modules in a larger network. So for instance, here we pick uh, one element of one network from subpopulation one to this node, 
And then here we take another one from one and here we take one from subpopulation two. And when you do that, you have this larger neural network, a deep learning network that has some repeatable components. So this is a nice idea. It allows you to separate uh, evolution modules and, sep and, and uh, overall topology. Um, and it actually works quite well, uh, both in vision and language tasks. Um, so here's one uh, such application. Uh, this was done in the image captioning domain, which was a Kaggle competition for, for quite a while, for several years. Uh, and uh, the winner, I think 2015, was uh, the Show and Tell Network, Oriol Vinales and, and, and others. Um, and uh, what we did here is to take that winning network, Show and Tell, and uh, take its components and make a search space uh, utilizing those components that were in there and see if we can use evolution to recombine and mutate those components in order to come up with better performing neural networks. And it turns out that evolution could do it. We actually got 5% improvement over the winning entry uh, after, after like three years of competition by just optimizing the existing network. Uh, so this is a demonstration um, of AI designing AI. Uh, we are using evolution to design a deep learning network uh, and it comes up with its own ideas of what works. So one principle that comes out and came out in this case and also in others is that there are multiple paths in this network, uh, <clears throat> not just simple residual components that repeat, but actual multiple paths. It, and, and we believe it's what it's doing is it's discovering that there are alternative solutions and it is pursuing multiple of them and eventually bringing them together to the final decision. And in this way, the network can hedge its bets and take into account more evidence and, and make more reliable decisions. So that's kind of an interesting principle that evolution discovers. Uh, so now the question is, yeah, we can do this um, from human starting point and, and improve. Can we make this actual automated system and what would we gain from it? Um, so we could call this evolutionary AutoML. Uh, currently there are AutoML systems and they are based on hyperparameter optimization. You can pose a problem, um, give a starting point and these AutoML systems on the web perhaps uh, then give you better um, solutions. Evolutionary AutoML expands on that in that not only it's evolving hyperparameters, but it can evolve these other aspects, including architectures. Uh, and there are several reasons why this is a good idea. Uh, we can start without much knowledge at all about the domain. I mean, not everybody is an expert in deep learning. So you can start with a naive baseline, something that say Kiraz or TensorFlow gives you and then evolve on top of that in order to get a good performance. Um, sometimes it is important to do better than anybody else. I mean, if you are doing medical diagnosis, every bit counts and you wanna push the envelope and do better than um, has been done before. And, and this kind of evolution optimization allows you to improve the performance. Uh, we might want to minimize the network resources. This has become a very big issue in, um, in recent times because um, these deep learning systems are very, very um, expensive. Uh, their carbon footprint is huge. So we could try to come up with networks that have reasonably small uh, carbon footprint uh, as well as performing well. And also the fourth dimension is that uh, in some cases, many times in the real world, there isn't enough training data to really take advantage of deep learning. I mean, we don't have 100 million examples of medical diagnosis, for instance. We have uh, maybe 10,000 or maybe 1,000, uh, but we have many different diseases and many different aspects um, of, of decision-making. We could bring those together into a single decision-making system that's doing multiple um, tasks at once and therefore utilize the wisdom from many different tasks in order to do well in each one. Uh, and for each of these cases, uh, neuroevolution um, of the structure gives you an advantage. So let's look at first, uh, the first two, uh, the uh, performance improvement from naive starting point and from state of the art. So this is one example of such uh, a domain. It's the Wikipedia toxic comment identification and Kaggle competition again. Um, Wikipedia has a commenting section. Sometimes people post just ridiculously um, vicious comments there and, uh, and we would like to recognize those automatically and rule them out so people don't have to look at them. Um, so uh, this is a nice data set. Um, if we take uh, the standard network that Kiras gives you for language processing and language classification, uh, this is the level of performance that we get. This is um, actually the, the, the loss um, or error uh, in that classification. Um, and then we can start with a uh, population that's randomly initialized and uh, spend some compute in order to do better. So here in uh, uh, x-axis, we see three parallel axes. Uh, this is generations. 
Uh, this is CPU training hours. Uh, and then this is the cost of those training hours if you use cloud compute to, to do it. Uh, and this green, uh, this decreasing plot shows us the, uh, the error um, on the networks that were evolved. And the horizontal lines give us various comparisons. So the first comparison is the Kiras baseline. It doesn't take much, only about 35 hours uh, to improve on that. Um, the next one is um, the Google Cloud Auto ML. Uh, at the time, there were two different levels an hour and, and, and a day. And this is the day level. Um, running Google Auto ML for a day, hyperparameter optimization uh, gives you this performance. And uh, with evolution, we can do better than that in about uh, 187 hours or so. Um, and then we'll continue evolution. It's getting a little harder. Uh, comparison here is the Microsoft TLC, multiple learning systems applied together in an ensemble. And so, um, and uh, if we spend about 800 hours, we, we can improve upon that. Um, and then we have two very close uh, lines here. One of them is uh, Mo, um, which is also CGOPT, uh, a Bayesian parameter optimization based system of hyperparameter optimization, really good hyperparameter optimization. Uh, that's one of those lines. And the other one is um, neuroevolution optimizing just hyperparameters, no architectures. So it's very comparable to uh, CGOPT, and turns out that they are indeed very similar. So this is really good hyperparameter optimization. Beyond that, is the advantage that we get if you optimize also the topology, also the architecture of the neural network. Um, and uh, here, the red line is the Kira's winner, the competition winner, the best possible human designs at the time. Uh, and then the green line is what evolution eventually discovered, optimizing hyperparameters as well as uh, the network architecture. And we see that there's actually a significantly different um, uh, performance there. So we can improve upon the best human designs if we give it enough compute. And in this case, it means 9,000 CPU hours. Um, so what is that? It's about $400. <laughs> so you can improve upon the state of the art if you have $400 to spare. Uh, and that's pretty nice. Uh, so it demonstrates both uh, improvement from an initially naive starting point, as well as uh, improvement of the state of the art if you care about it. So you have to spend a little bit more compute, although it's quite reasonable still, uh, but you can advance the state of the art. Um, um, and you know, there's uh, also a nice paper on taking advantage of the same approach in actual application of estimating a person's age from, uh, from an image, uh, which is useful in medical aesthetics, for instance. And we have a gecko paper this year on that. Um, so that was the first and the second argument. The third one is minimizing network resources. And it's interesting when evolution uh, designs these networks, in the population, there are already trade-offs between performance uh, and size. So this is a proxy for the size of the network, cost of training, how much, how much training it takes to reach it, uh, a certain accuracy, accuracy is in Y. So the best network, this is the toxicity domain again, uh, takes a long time uh, to train. But if you're a little impatient, you can get almost as good performance with much less compute. Uh, so there's only a 0.38% drop in performance with one twelfth of the, of the size of the network, much smaller network. Uh, and, and that might be something that's a good trade-off if you wanna minimize the carbon footprint as well as get a prominent uh, useful performance. Um, now, it, if you just run regular neuroevolution, you, you'll see that and you can pick from uh, different parts of the evolution. These tend to be early results and these tend to be later results, but you can do this also more systematically uh, if, you, if you optimize both size and, uh, and, and performance in multi-objective um, approach. Uh, here are some examples of what we get. Uh, this is the initial network, very simple one. Uh, this is the final network all the way to the right. Uh, the blueprint is in here. And these are some of the modules that go into the different locations in the blueprint. And that's why it's a very large network because there's one really large module that's used multiple times. Um, and here's a network and that elbow that might be a good trade-off. Uh, it's uh, still a relatively deep network, but it consists of simpler modules, and therefore it's, uh, it's a lot more economical. So that's what evolution discovers if you are trying to optimize the size. All right, so that was uh, the uh, idea of say, um, coming up with minimal networks as well as good performance. Now, what about taking advantage of multiple data sets? Uh, so indeed, problem in the real world is that your data sets are small, but there are many different data sets that might be related or at least related enough that you can learn from them and apply them to other tasks. So one great 
benchmark example of, of that is, is the Omniglot data set from MIT, MIT. So here, there are 110 characters in multiple different alphabets, 50 altogether. Um, and you're trying to learn, of course, to recognize the characters in all of those. Uh, now, if you try to just train, say, a Latin network by using examples from Latin, you reach a certain level of performance. But it turns out that if you simultaneously learn all of these other alphabets, you get better performance in Latin too. Uh, there's crossover or there's leakage or, or generalization from multiple data sets so that each one is, is actually better. Um, and that's something that that's the promise of multitask learning. Learn many tasks at once and you can do better in each one. Uh, one question is, well, what is an architecture that take advantage, takes advantage of those multiple tasks in a maximal way? Should we have just a single kind of a trunk line, baseline, and then multiple heads for the different alphabets, different tasks? Or do we have multiple paths that continuously talk to each other or something more complex in arbitrary topology? Uh, that's the question. Evolution can be used to come up with an optimal way of combining the knowledge and wisdom from multiple data sets. Um, so we did apply it to the Omniglot and indeed found that uh, different architectures work well on different tasks if they use the same modules. So we evolved a set of modules, used them in all, but customized the, the topology. And in this case, we actually improved the state of the art by 31%, which is a pretty huge improvement uh, coming up in an optimal architecture that forms internal representations that combine the wisdom of multiple tasks. Uh, we've applied it to other domains as well. Uh, face multi-attribute uh, classification, whether the person is young, old, um, you know, has dark blonde hair, um, glasses, no glasses, many different attributes. Um, and uh, it turns out that we can improve the state of the art there as well. Not quite as much because this is a domain that's already been uh, studied quite a bit, but still a significant improvement for this, uh, in the state of the art. So the point here is that we can combine learning from multiple tasks uh, by evolving an architecture that takes maximum advantage, constructs internal representations that support all of those. Uh, so this is a big step towards making deep learning available in the real world. Uh, we can, for instance, um, build a custom image recognition problem, whatever it might be, uh, license plates, defects on an assembly line, uh, x-rays of uh, various pathologies by using other data sets that already exist. Um, as, as a kind of a crutches or help data, helpful data set so that we can improve performance in the one that we actually care about. Uh, now let's uh, come back to the uh, uh, top level and look at the third um, topic of this tutorial, which is to try to use neuroevolution uh, as a proxy for evolution in the real world and especially understanding um, some of the fundamental questions about evolution of intelligence. Um, and this is really an interesting topic. And I think uh, we are ready to make progress on it. The methods are powerful enough. We have enough compute that we can look at questions like, like that um, using simulations. Um, and I'll give you a, an, an one example here, um, which is evolution of virtual creatures, evolved virtual creatures. Uh, and the idea here is that if you evolve um, the physical structure of the agent at the same time as you evolve its brain, its controller, uh, you get something that looks very natural. No, the, the behavior is optimized towards that architecture and this architecture of the, of the uh, structure of the animate is optimized for what it can do. And therefore it looks natural. So here we are evolving, this is Dan Lessons work. We are evolving um, agent designs based on cylinders, um, and muscles that connect them uh, with different kinds of joints, as well as uh, sensors like that sense light, uh, for instance. Um, and then we have three principles, encapsulation of behavior, competition of behavior, and a syllabus of tasks. Um, so uh, this is the idea of encapsulation. Um, so here we are evolving simply a network to uh, move the agent forward. And there are many solutions to this. Multiple legs, for instance. This one is kind of fun. Uh, it's like a UPS guy is just uh, carrying a heavy packet. And it turns out if you just uh, jiggle the packet the right way, uh, the um, agent will run, uh, move forward by jumping. Um, so that's kind of a fun solution. So once we evolve the controller that does that, we encapsulate it and have a trigger node. Uh, and the trigger node tells you um, to activate the behavior. So whenever that node is activated, uh, the agent starts running. 
now like that. And when you turn it off, it stops running. So this is an encapsulated simple behavior. Um, now pandemonium means that you have conflicting behaviors. For instance, you can't turn left and right at the same time. So you have a pandemonium relationship between them. You either activate right or you activate left, but not both at the same time. Um, so that's the that's a standard um, uh, element of, of this uh, approach as well. Uh, and the third element is syllabus. And this means that you come up with human designer comes up with a hierarchy of behaviors, starting from simple ones uh, to more complex ones. And in this case, Dan came up with a hierarchy um, all the way to fight or flight. Um, so starting from simple forward movement and turning, um, attacking and retreating and then fight or flight dimension. Um, so, but, but the body and the brain are evolved together uh, throughout this hierarchy. And that's what gives you interesting behaviors. So uh, let's look at how this fight or flight is constructed. Um, here's uh, turn to light behavior. That's the first level of complexity. Um, you are selecting between left turn and right turn based on where you sense the light. So this object here has a light source in the, in the middle and the agent can sense it and therefore it turns uh, towards the light. Um, so this is simply selecting from alternative primitives. Uh, in the next level, you not only turn to the light, but you also move to it. You have a forward motion um, encapsulated behavior and you can select that after you turn to light and you actually get to the target. Now, this is not really new. Already Sims in uh, 1994 uh, evolved agents that did this. And this has been replicated many times, this kind of following a target behavior. Um, and actually it has been kind of a bottleneck. I mean, it hasn't been possible to do more complex behaviors than this. And this was actually Dan's uh, goal uh, to go beyond uh, this, this first level of complexity, Sims behavior and others, and, and evolve more complex behaviors. Um, now, um, and that will be fight or flight. So let's look at, we need uh, a strike um, in order to attack. And then in this case, it's the force that you um, impose on, on the ground. And you can do it by jumping. You can do it with a very big arm that hits the ground. It's a jumping um, approach. And once you have this strike, you can attack. And that means uh, you find the object, turn to it, walk to it, and then you jump on it. And the amount of force here is indicated by the light. Uh, so this is the attack behavior. And this is already one level beyond Sims and others uh, because it's one next level in the hierarchy, utilizing those first level behaviors. Um, now, in order to do um, flight as well, we need a behavior that's uh, turning away from um, a target. Like this is a bad target, don't look at it, uh, turn away. Uh, and then we also need a, a retreat uh, that turn away and then run away. And that's what we see here. This is a bad object, run away from it. And this is an alternative second level behavior to attack, the retreat. Now we can put these together to fight or flight. Depending on what the object is like, you, you uh, turn to it and go to it and attack, uh, but then it turns into a bad object. So you run away. <laughs> you know? uh, and that's a good idea because it looks like a nasty object. Um, and this is now the fight or flight behavior, third level of complexity, two levels beyond um, Sims and others. Um, but notice, of course, that it was constructed, the hierarchy was constructed by hand, um, and that gives you this uh, level of complexity. But there's an interesting insight here, and it is this body brain coevolution that you are evolving the structure of the agent at the same time as you're evolving its, its behavior. And that's why it appears believable, uh, because the behaviors look natural, uh, and uh, so much so that when you are Watching this for a while, you start feeling for the agents. They look purposeful and you feel really bad for them if, if something bad were to happen uh, as there is obviously a post, supposed to happen right here. Yeah, the bad object actually uh, kills, <laughs> kills the agent and, and the body parts everywhere and it's all sad. But uh, the point here is that the behavior is believable. And this is also what worked in, in bot price. Remember we put in the constraints and optimized under constraints and that resulted in believable behavior. Similarly, as we optimized here under the constraints of the body design. So um, what does this mean in terms of constructing intelligent systems? So we have an idea that we could evolve believable complex behavior in these environments where agents are embedded and they have limited abilities and they are constraints in the environment uh, as well. Um, and in this case, we could hope to come up with an open-ended arms race where gradually you get more and more complex behaviors. And there have been uh, simulations like that, for instance, simulations of um, 
predators and prey uh, that co-evolve gradually more complex behaviors in order to uh, deceive the predator and, and then uh, attack in, in, in teams in order to catch the prey and so on. Um, and this is very similar to self-play in, for instance, Alpha Zero. Um, and the idea is that we could, in principle, discover complexity uh, beyond human ability to design it. Um, now, the challenge is to build these open-ended environments that would last for a while, that could present more and more challenging um, situations. And we have some starting of that already, like the poet system uh, evolving running tracks and behaviors that manage them, and Eureka coming up with more and more complex equations to explain data. Um, so building on these ideas, I think, in the future could potentially allow us to scale to these really interesting questions about, uh, about emergence of intelligence. Um, so uh, to conclude, um, in neuroevolution, we can extend uh, AI, artificial intelligence, from simply prediction to also creativity uh, and behavior. Uh, so from modeling to optimization, so uh, deep learning to evolution of, of these uh, structures. Uh, and that's what evolution optimization gives you, new strategic uh, and novel behaviors, as well as complexity in deep learning that's otherwise hard to get to, and gaining insights into origins of intelligence. So that's what neuroevolution is about. Uh, and if you're interested, there's quite a bit of future further material. Um, this talk and various demos are available on, on the internet, um, as well as articles that are short summaries of neuroevolution, as well as a more in-depth article um, a couple of years ago in Nature uh, Machine Intelligence. Um, and there are also some general resources like um, proposals for neural architecture search benchmarks and some software that would go along with it. Um, so take a look at these if you want to take the steps. And I think there's quite a bit that we can do in the next uh, few years and uh, with neuroevolution and uh, be building behaviors that are more complex as well as uh, deep learning architectures that are um, better than what we have today. Um, so that's it. And thanks for your attention.